please join me in welcoming Ariel Dorfman to the stage. So one of the problems that I've got tonight is that uh, this, this story is longer than the time allotted to me. So, and I'm not even going to uh, show you the centerfold, or maybe I should. Uh, well, anyway, this is not about her. It's about something else. But a woman is involved. In fact, several women are involved in this. But, so this, this story is called it's Asylum. And uh, the only way in which I, could, I can, I can uh, tell this story is I have to cut the first third of it and go straight to the end. Or I could read the first two thirds and leave you guys not knowing what the end would be like. But if you leave, if you all note down your names or emails, I'll send you the whole story, okay? So you can see that. So here's the thing. Barrera, B-A-R-R-E-R-A, -R -R -E Barrera, has come far in the world. The illegitimate son of a U.S. diplomat and a Colombian prostitute, his language skills in English and Spanish allows him to rise, marry an American woman, Cynthia, migrate to the States, and become head translator, head chancho of Spanish into English at the State Department. Cynthia, having died of cancer, has left him with uh, his 16-year-old son, Ricky, Ricardo, let's say, right, um, on his own. One day, a message flashes on Ricky's email in Spanish, which Richie does, Ricky doesn't know how to read. And it's the first of many messages from a certain commando anesthesia, meaning commando anesthesia, right? The messages get ever more dire over the next few hours. If you want this to end, it says in Spanish, you know what you need to do. And then, a bit later, again in Spanish, te vamos a matar como un perro. We're going to kill you like a dog. No, like, no, not like a dog, because dogs deserve something better. And then a while later, your dad knows what this means, meaning Barrera knows. And also, this is not a threat. Your dad knows this is not a threat. And finally, ask your father to tell you what happened in Colombia just before you were born. All these on, the, on, on this, these email messages from Comando Anesthesia. Barrera doesn't call the police. He pretends not to know what any of this is about drops Ricky off at school and goes to his office, and that's where we pick up the story. The first thing Barrera did at work, before he'd even stripped off his coat glistening with snow, before he tasted the coffee his secretary had poured for him, before he even said hello to her, to anybody, the first thing was to log on, scuttle into Ricky's email, and there it was, on his screen, floating like an eye in the sky of his screen, on his screen like an eye opening and closing, Antes de que cumpla los 17, lo tienes que hacer antes. Before his 17th birthday, you have to do it before then. He logged onto Ricky's email account. Was it also there? Had the sender found a way to? It was there. Also there in the subject. Soon he'll be of age. And the same words in the message itself in Spanish with the automatic translator inside Barrera kept repeating. Before his 17th birthday, you have to do it before then. He clicked savagely on the reply button. ¿Quién eres? He wrote. And then deleted the words in a rush. He knew it was, who it had to be on the other end of the email. The one person it couldn't be, that woman was. Barrera drank down the coffee in one gulp, burning his throat, happy to feel his mouth and tongue and throat scalded, thro throbbing, proof that he was alive, that Ricky was alive somewhere in the same city, in the same galaxy. Even he was probably looking at the same words right now. Antes de que cumpla 17, lo tiene que hacer antes. And Ricky wouldn't show it to any of his classmates who spoke Spanish or any of his teachers. And he wouldn't mention it to Barrera when they met that night for dinner, not then, not ever. Ricky would make believe, just like his father, nobody was sending these messages. Nobody was erasing them. Because Barrera did erase the next message over and over. The next message, it was a number, 2,516. When it appeared at 3 in the morning with Ricky slumbering in the next room and Barrera watching his son's inbox as if it were a wild animal about to leap out of the machine, one second after that number flickered inside the new message from Comando Anesthesia, his finger was there, stabbing it, obliterated, gone, gone forever. Though no, it came back. It returned from who knows where. It now and now. Now now the number was re-emerging directly on the screen. It didn't come in a message. It didn't tumble into the inbox. It didn't have a subject. Not from anyone. Not with a reply even feasible. Just flashing off and on the screen. Invading his screen and Ricky's screen. Not a wink. He responded to his son's unasked un un question the next day. I never sleep. You know that. Except this time it was true. And this time Ricky was the one who pretended that everything was normal. 
Everything was fine. This time it was the boy's turn not to say anything, not a word, not even to remind his father that his birthday was coming up three days from now. Barrera called in sick. He heard Ricky puttering around the house, sitting in his computer and then getting up noisily and then sitting down quietly again. And Barrera didn't tell, him his, tell his son he should be going to school, didn't tell him anything. Both of them secluded in the house as if a blizzard had descended in the garden. Right there, outside the door, a plague seething just beyond the threshold if either of them dared to open the door. Barrera looked at the empty screen, waited, tried not to close his eyes, closed them instantaneously, opened them again, because that one was inside the inbox of his eyes, in there and out there and in here somewhere, esa mujer. He wasn't going to fall asleep. He couldn't afford to fall asleep. His eyes strayed to the picture of Cynthia. Remember, that's his, his wife. Her last photo before she became too ill to go out, not a sign of what was gnawing away at her bones, a smile like heaven on her lips, and underneath the words she wanted him to remember when things got rough, the words she had written in her flawless, tight script, don't ever look back. Easy for you to say that, he said to her. And then Shoki said, no, no, no. He wasn't going to start speaking to Cynthia's photo as if it were a person of flesh and blood and limb and, and, and ears. What came next? Talking to the screen as if it were asking what would happen if these messages started to appear in every screen, everywhere, for everyone. If a todos no, came the answer on the screen. Solo a tu hijo. Not everyone. Just your son. But then I tried to rub that one out as soon as it materialized. Get rid of the son of a bitch. It didn't go away. It wouldn't go away until it was good and ready. Those words came and went of their own accord now, regardless of what he did, regardless of the fact that now only two days remained until Ricky's birthday. Neither of them mentioning this, calling in sick father and then son. Yes, yes, a bug is going around, eating up the supplies in the fridge and the pantry, not venturing out to even retrieve the Washington Post, watching the papers accumulate outside like a dead dog in the snow. Hardly acknowledging each other's existence except at breakfast, except to say, thanks for the pancakes, Dad, except to answer, just like your mother used to make them, hijo. Not mentioning that one day from now, tomorrow, it was going to be Ricky's birthday. The only difference between them, that the son slept at night and the Barrera had not slept for five days, for five nights. Not a wink, not a minute, not an hour. Now truly nothing, nada. Staring at the night, staring at the night as if it were a screen, staring at his wife's photo as if it were a window into the day. Antes de que cumpla 17. Four hours to go before his son turns 17. If you want this to end, then you know what to do. Si quieres que esto se termine, ya sabes lo que tienes que hacer. But he didn't. He didn't know what he needed to do. Dime, ¿qué tengo que hacer? What if he did ask the photo what to do? What was needed? Don't ever look back. His wife's only answer then and now. Dime, ¿qué tengo que hacer? ¿Qué quieres de mí? He didn't know anymore if he was thinking those words or saying them out loud. What do you want from me? The glimmer of a whisper that nobody present or far away could ever have registered. Not even Barrera could have heard those words so faint. So quiet, not with a tape recorder, not with a secret camera. Ricky couldn't eavesdrop on those words. That's how hidden Barrera's thoughts had become. What do you want from me? The screen said nothing. Do you want to take my boy? Is that what you want? No answer, not a shimmer on the screen before his mind founded for lack of sleep, faltered into a sea of confusion, unable to distinguish anything anymore, having to comfort himself with those words written so many days ago, they seemed a mirage. This is not a threat. Your dad knows this is not a threat. What do you want from me? What happened in Colombia, Dad, before I was born? It couldn't be Ricky who was asking that again. He went to his son's room, and Ricky was blessedly asleep, smiling. The kid was smiling at the softness of the pillow, smiling as if hell did not exist, as if he would not have to awaken to his 17th birthday a few hours from now and find out that hell did exist. Nothing, he whispered to, risk, to Ricky. Nothing happened. He left the room and went straight to his own computer and opened an email addressed to his son. He typed in what had just mur he had just murmured to Ricky, spilled the black and quiet milk of denial onto the screen, a last desperate attempt to keep at bay the other words, the other words that had been simmering inside him since the message about the dog. The perro on the screen, we're going to kill you like a human being should be killed, slowly so you know what is happening to you. Since then, nothing, Barrera wrote, nothing happened, and heard his voice say, it's God's truth. And he began to write those words as well and then found his fingers erasing them, all of it. He discovered the blank screen once again there, the cursor blanking on and off and once again asking him to, asking him, what? What did that woman want from him? Ricardo. He said those syllables out loud and wrote his son's name down on the screen. Querido Ricardo, Ricky mio, my Ricky. And then it was about to write, we all do things in our lives that, but no, it wasn't that. And then there was a woman many years ago who, and it wasn't that either, it was, it was. It happened before Ricky was born. Mother and I, we'd been out for drinks and intended to go dancing after dinner. She was trying a sancocho de pescado, but not me. No fish stew for me. I was a steak man. And I can remember the precise moment when everything changed, when it was about to happen the next day, was set in motion. 
We were at a table on the sidewalk and two gamines, you know, street kids? They were watching us from behind a parked car. They'd been shooed away by the waiter and then the maitre d' and then some burly security guards, but the boys, waves really, kept on popping up, peering at us. One of them, well, he even winked at me and sort of smirked, a leer perhaps I'd call it. His teeth were perfectly white, straight and perfect, as if he had been well nourished at home, as if nobody had ever beat him or punched him or raped him or forced him to roam the avenues of Bogota. I knew that kid. I could have been that kid when my father left us in Buenaventura. I think that if I hadn't been blessed with English, with the certainty that I belonged elsewhere, I'd have taken to the streets myself. I'm sure that my mother wouldn't have come after me to bring her son home. My mother was too busy sniffing for a substitute for her vanished gringo, my vanished gringo dad. So when the gamin winked at me, I knew what his lewd gesture meant. It was a wink of encouragement that said, yes, I should ask the gorgeous redhead home with me. I should show her a good time, promise me that she would say yes. And how strange that I should need his approval from that lost child, not older than eight, because I turned to her and said, you know, I never sleep, but I think tonight's different. Tonight I won't sleep due to another reason. And she answered as the street urgent had anticipated, we'll see if you're right. My response to that acknowledgement had been expected. Not what she or I had been planning, I think, but maybe not unexpected for the two gamines. Because I stood up with my plate, half the steak was still on it, and all the potatoes and remnants of a lovely baronet sauce. And I carried it to the kids and just gave it to them, plate and all, a reward for their witnessing of my triumph. What I had not dared to do or ask or dream of up to that moment. And somehow also a way of telling them, you kids can also make it this far like I have. I educated myself. I read every book in every library. I found a way. I'm going to make love to this wondrous green guy. Then we're going to leave this stink hole of a country. And I did it all on my own. You kids don't have to stay behind. You can come along too. You can also change your life. And I waited a bit while they tasted the steak, munched it in a, bit, in a much too leisurely way for two famished scamps. So I asked them how the meat was, if it was good. And the kid who had winked at me repeated his perfect smile with his perfect teeth. So out of place in that grimy, bedrugged face, he said, in Spanish, of course, he said, the steak up the street at El Barranco, it's better. Free-ranging cattle, more tender, juicier, you know? And he deciphered the su surprise in my eyes and added, sobras, leftovers. He and his pal had been scrounging in the garbage. They knew where the best meat could be found, and now he was acting as my culinary guide to Bogota, my gourmet gamin. When I returned to the woman who was going to be your mother, she listened to my story and nod in that bird-like wonder way of hers, just like you. From the moment I met her, I was so taken with her ability to stop what she was doing like a chachalaca, Think of a bird that can dance the cha-cha and then see suddenly Ricardo. Well, that's how she looked at me entirely still, as if she were wary of some assault from nearby. The very first time I laid on as her, I realized how vulnerable she was underneath that show of toughness. It wasn't just that we had to be cautious. In fact, as employees of the US government in a country torn apart by civil war and narcos and the FARC and bomb, we'd make a nice morsel for everyone intent on kidnapping, her especially. I wasn't worth anything, not then. Later, yes, when I became a citizen, took on the country of my dad. Now, yes, if someone looked to kill me, now, now. But I was telling you about that look of hers, which came, I said, from somewhere other than the fear of the immediate violence that could be done to us. No, it came from some older tremor, something else. She looked at me when I came back from giving away my steak and said, you're too good to be true. And then, mañana, one of the few words in Spanish she ever learned. She repeated in English, tomorrow, I'll come home with you tomorrow, because first in the morning there's something I need you to do. First you have to do something, a test. That's what she had in store for me. It was a woman. Maybe you won't believe me, but I can't remember her name. Some way we can look it up. There must be files on her somewhere. Her husband would call this Esteban, Esteban something. He'd been killed, headed a trade union, a coffee worker, I think maybe textiles, food worker. And his wife was seeking asylum or a visa if asylum couldn't be granted. One for her, one for her son. Her 17-year-old son. Yes, 17. But it has stopped. He reread the last paragraph. He erased the yes, 17. Then he erased her 17-year-old son. Ricardo didn't know to know, need to know the age of that boy. That boy, that young man, name of Luis, maybe Lalo. Yes, Lalo. I think it was from Eduardo. Lalo received the death threat. I had read it in her file. They were going to kill him like a dog. No, not like a dog. Slowly. Before the woman came for the, in for the interview, your mother left the room, left me alone with her on purpose. Want to see how you handle yourself by yourself. Cynthia said, stepping out the back door, adding there on the threshold, almost as an afterthought, that I'd been selected for a training program back in the States. She'd recommended me, the sky was the limit. I remember those words, the sky being the limit. Everything open for me, her and the country and the future, and someone like you, the sky. She recommended me, your mother reiterated, but she wanted first to observe me in action. She said, one last crack. I remember that. That's when I was examining attenti attentively when that woman entered the room and sat down without my invitation, just sat down and pierced me with the black coil of her eyes as I read the message written on that crude piece of paper, scrawled by someone who would not mind if an expert analyzed the handwriting. If the criminal's fingerprints were smudged all over that scrap of paper. A person who was an expert himself, an expert at creating fear in others, not concerned about his own fear. That's why I understood as I read. 
Have you denounced this to the police? I asked in Spanish. 2,516. Perdone, ¿qué dijo? 2,516, she said in Spanish. The number of trade union members, today is May Day, by the way, who have been murdered in the last 10 years, 2,515 plus one, my husband. And she pronounced his family name, the one I can't remember now. She said Esteban, Esteban, and that's surname. And before I could comment, offer my condolences, say something, anything, she added, do you know how many arrests there have been, how many culprits have been arrested? And she answered her own question. One, she said. One man has been arrested, a policeman. One person, that's all. And he'll be out on bail soon, and then he'll be up in the mountains with the paras and never be seen again. Inside your mother's big, broad desk, I knew a tape recorder was turning, registering every word of hers and mine. I knew that in, her mother's, in your mother's office, a security camera always recorded everything, every whisper. I answered, you can't expect us to take in every person who's threatened, who says she's threatened, who offers no more proof than a piece of paper whose origin we can't substantiate. Surely you can see that, ma'am. No podemos aceptar a todos. A todos no, she said. Solo a mi hijo. Not everyone, just my son. And then she winked at me. It wasn't really a wink. More like the flutter of an eyelid, a shuddering, the rapid deployment of a butterfly in her eyes, closing them just enough so I wouldn't catch even a glimpse of the promise of tears. But she wasn't going to give me or anybody else the satisfaction of seeing her cry. She's cried so much there's nothing left. And then the opposite thought. She hasn't cried for years, is scared to start because she may never stop. And then the woman stood up, refused to sit down again, though I insisted. She didn't explain why. Just stood there, brusquely said in one word, God. That's the word she said and added. God often comes to us from behind. Remember that. He comes when we least expect him, from behind. And again, her eyes that opened and shut rapidly. And I don't know why. Yes, I know why. Of course I know why. I confused that fluttering again with a wink. It joined me and her to the gaminas of the last night, that night before the night you were conceived. And it wasn't me answering her. I forgot where I was, who I was, what I wanted to become. Forgot who was listening to me from the other side of the back door. I forgot how often in the past I had taken the files and folders and papers that your mother would pass to me, how often I'd closed them with a snap. And I was open that file. The death threat was lying in there, calling to me, asking me to read it again. When I picked it up because I could not say no to it, the night one last appraisal, what revealed itself, what had been hidden below that death threat, was the faded photo of her dead husband and also the pretty visa photo of her living son, one next to the other, her two men. And then, if only for a minute, it was just me and my sad, beating heart, if only for a minute, and I said, Naturalmente, of course, we'll give you asylum, a visa, ma'am. No le quepa duda. That's a promise? And I said, yes. And she said, swear it on your son. I don't have a son. Swear it on the life of your unborn child. And that's what I did, Ricardo. I swear I was telling her the truth. Swear it on your life. I never saw her again because her mother came into the room as soon as that woman was gone. She looked at me. You really are too good to be true. She didn't say anything else. Just waited like you do so often. Let the silence grow until somebody like me, somebody who feels uncomfortable with stillness and survive by filling the universe with words, since I can recall, I would jump into the space yawning between my father and my mother. I would leap in, vault in, rush in to see if I could bring them closer, because I could tell they were going to separate, that I was the one who had kept them together. My existence had done that. My birth had made my father stay. And I spent the first eight years of my childhood going back and forth between them, saying in English to my dad what my mother meant in her Buenaventura Spanish, extricating from my dad's Ohioan accent what, what he wanted from my mother, back and forth, ida y vuelta, giving them refuge in the common territory of my tongue, holding them to each other as I felt them drift apart. Their home, I had become their home as if they were to stay by each other's side. And your own mother knew this, merely by instinct and cunning and command, that she didn't need to do anything other than let me dangle in the silence of her puzzlement, her challenge that I explained myself. And I did. It took me less than a minute, not even a minute, to close that file, snap it tightly shut. Asylum denied, I said. No visa for either of them. Not clear if they have terrorist connections. She didn't say anything. Again, she just let me swing a while in the dark sun of her gaze. I, didn't, I just didn't have the heart to tell the woman, I said. To her face, I mean, I just didn't have the heart. And now Cynthia answered, yes, she said. Just that one word. She said yes to me. So that night, I like to think that that was the night when you were conceived, Ricardo. I like to think that something good came of this, not just our marriage and my training and my promotion and my future citizenship. I'm in your country. You, I like to tell myself that you were born because what I did, because of what happened in Colombia, what the message has demanded of me that I tell you. That's what I have to say what I need to tell you before you are 17. Barrera stopped. Behind him, he sensed his son, told himself that the boy had been there for who knows how long, reading over his shoulder for who knew how long. And somehow this time, Barrera found the strength not to turn around and address Ricky. He found the patience to swallow any word of welcome or of dismissal, was given the strength by someone, perhaps his wife, perhaps his mother, both of them dead. He discovered the strength to wait and let his son say something first. So who is it? Ricky asked finally. 
who was sending us, you and me, these messages, almost as if he were a child asking a magician to explain how the rabbit could disappear, be cut to shreds and none reappear, one last moment of innocence before I outgrew it, one last chance. It can't be the husband, Barreras said, taking his time, because he's dead, that man called Esteban. And the woman, the woman whose name you can't recall, not her, said Barrera, and not her son Luis or Lalo, and then added, they were executed the night before your mother and I left Bogota. How did they die? Not that, he said. And then still without turning around to look at his son, there are things you really don't need to know, not yet. I don't need to know what was done to their bodies, Rissy asked, what, how, how slow it must have been. You don't need to know. Ricky didn't speak for a while, but I could imagine him there at all, barely imagine him there at all, make, thinking all this over. Then, all right, so who else knew what happened in that room, what you promised, a colleague, someone, anyone? Only me, said Varreda. I'm the only one who knows. From time to time, I ask your mother, ask her picture, not with words, not, but with my eyes, you know. I suggest that maybe there could have been another way, that maybe we could have found a different, even if I know that she was also acting under orders, only following protocol. This Esteban had been fingered as a sympathetic, the guerrillas, was subversive. And above your mother in the pyramid of power, there was someone else, and then the head of that department, the man above them, and somebody upstairs would eventually seen the asylum granted, would have reprimanded her, maybe demoted her, maybe denied me my transfer, my residency, or my citizenship one day. It was me or that woman, our son or her son. That's how things are. And by now, Barreta was speaking to the computer, straight to the screen, or what was inside the screen or beyond it. All of us is doing our job, just securing the border, just keeping our children safe. Better to be safe than sorry. That's what I say silently to your mother, have said to her since she died. It was mom answer. Nothing, not a word. What could she tell us? What could she answer? Unless, unless Barrera said. But neither of them dared to add another word, tell each other what they were thinking, what they were both. This was as far as he could go. This was the end. But in a sense, the sudden absence was certainly the sun was no longer behind him, that Ricky had decided to return to his room before dawn arrived. That's where he wanted to greet this day when he would be 17, when he would be of age. Barrera waited. He gave the boy time to cross the corridor, open the door to his room, sit down in front of his own computer. He waited until he was sure Ricky was ready, and then, without looking one last time at the letter he had written, without correcting one word of it, he pressed the send button. It was on its way, his response, what he needed to do. He prayed it would be enough, and he wondered. Barrera also managed to wonder as the sun began to rise in that foreign scar if he would sleep well that night if we would sleep at all in the nights to come. Thank you so much. <laughs>